Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our World Management, Management, Management and General Practice webinar. My name is Helene, and I'm the Workforce Development Officer at Westwick PHN. I'll be facilitating this evening alongside me is Erin, who also in our workforce team. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the unceded lands and waterways. We recognise their diversity, resilience and the ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. We support self-determination for First Nations peoples and organisations. Just a little bit of housekeeping. The majority of our webinars are recorded and freely available in our PHN Learn YouTube channel that's up on the screen at the moment. Um, and I also have our upcoming events on the screen, which you can register via our website. Link, we've put the link to those in our chat as well. Um, please make note of the health, health pathways relating to this topic, and that's on the screen at the moment. Uh, just a little bit about our needs assessment now that we're running here. We want to understand the needs of the communities that we serve. Every three years, we ask people that live and work in our communities about the health issues they face and what services they need to address these issues. We want to know what health issues are most important to you and your community, your ideas for addressing these health issues and what services are required. You can fill out a short survey, use a map to tell us about your health and service needs or tell us a story that demonstrates the need. You can also request a phone call or meeting with you at your practice to share your thoughts. Head to our project page to share your thoughts, sign up for updates or request a meeting. We can also provide materials for you to promote the engagement process to your patients and colleagues. We will be starting the process in early October, but the project page is live now. Well, it's already October. Sign up for updates and request a meeting. Um, now, about the webinar tonight, if you have entered this webinar and not displayed your accurate first and last name, could you please type them into the chat box? Um, only the admin will be able to see this. It's just to ensure that you, we get your certificate of attendance. For this evening webinar, all participants will remain on mute. And if you have any questions, we do welcome questions, please type them in the Q&A box and they will, we will ask them on your behalf at, to the presenter um, at the end of the evening. There is a link to the chat box to complete the survey after the webinar and we will show this slide again at the end of the presentation. This, this evening's speaker is Jan Rice, Director Jan Rice Wound Care Services. I will now hand over to Jan. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Just going to share my screen now. When I see, I can see it's up there. Um, can you see my screen now? No, no, we can't. No. So share screen. There we go. Yes, we can now. Thank you. Okay, everyone, um, welcome to tonight's talk. Um, I have a lot uh, of content in here, so I am going to speak fairly quickly. Um, but the copy of the handout has been sent to the office, and so if you wish to get a copy, a PDF copy of the handout, uh, you're most welcome to ask for it. Um, so we're going to look at how wounds heal, what can go wrong, um, products that you should think about, skin tears, ulceration of lower legs, and with any luck, time for questions. So this should be a slide that is reminiscent to some of you when you would have done anatomy and physiology and you learned about how wounds heal. All wounds start with bleeding. Hopefully that bleeding will settle very, very quickly when you have vasoconstriction, platelet aggregation and leukocyte migration. You then move into, once you've made that blood clot, which is the trigger to tell the body that you have a wound, uh, you then move into the inflammatory phase, um, although surgeons also call that the reactive phase. And that's when the neutrophils uh, are going to come into the site, the macrophages will come out, and the whole role of those uh, structures, uh, cells, is to clear the wound, to clean it. So phagocytosis and removal of foreign body and bacteria. 
once that's been done, which in theory is about 72 hours, uh, you're going to start to move into the proliferation of fibroblasts and collagen synthesis with extracellular matrix reorganization, angiogenesis, and then finally making granulation tissue and epithelialization. So that takes a few weeks. Um, then you move into the remodeling phase. And this remodeling phase goes on for weeks to months to years. Some documents actually even say 18 months to have the healed wound. So you're given about four weeks to make a difference to a wound. So you've got somebody coming in, you've got a wound, you're going to clean it, you're going to put a dressing on it according to the tissue, etc. And then at each review, you want to see some improvement, some improvement, some improvement. It's when you see the wound stagnating or when you see a change in the quality of the tissue that you start to panic because you realize, uh oh, something's going wrong here and I'm not on the right track for healing. So what can influence healing? Textbooks have various ways of describing it. Some talk about local and general factors. Uh, some talk about internal and external. It doesn't really matter. They all end up saying roughly the same. Uh, there are intrinsic and extrinsic factors that will influence healing. And we have to go through these and work out what is related to our patient. So currently right now I have a patient whose wound's not progressing as well as we would have liked and they're a diabetic and their uh, blood glucose levels are too high. Um, they're sneaking Tim Tams and all sorts of other things behind our back. And we're having trouble keeping their blood sugars at a nice stable level. That's going to affect wound healing. So you may have other things like you can see on the screen here that are influencing your healing. This is from a textbook that does help us to try and understand uh, why a wound might stall. So I'm going to go round each of these boxes. No trigger of acute damage. Well, what kind of person would have no trigger that they've got a wound? Well, it's a person who's already taking anti-inflammatory medication, uh, someone who, who can't actually raise that response to the injury. What about the next one that says exaggerated inflammation and pain? So that's a person who gets a wound and the body takes off uh, with it. So they're the people who may already have autoimmune inflammatory disorders such as Crohn's disease um, uh, or rheumatoid arthritis. So they have an exaggerated inflammation. Then you come into the increased matrix metalloproteases and decreased tissue inhibitors of metalloproteases. Well, we can't see them. So if, as clinicians, it's kind of we're surmising maybe there's something wrong here or even the next one, the uh, deficiency of growth factor receptors and destruction of growth factors by ma matrix metalloproteases. Then we've got next one, senescent fibroblast. That is when we take a sample of the tissue, we actually have fibroblasts there, but they've all gone to sleep. So we need to kickstart them. And what kickstarts them? Good wound cleaning. Then the next one, uh, I've got my slide over the top, so I have to move it, increased bio burden um, and biofilm. So that's a real issue. Uh, and, of course, it's become a big issue, this whole discussion around biofilm. So I'll cover that in a moment. Loss of moisture control, someone who has gross edema and they're just leaking, 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 leaking. Well, they're washing away all the good cells. And then there's an alteration in the nitric oxide levels, and this is all to do with reactive oxygen species, etc. So I suggest that you use this mnemonic called HEIDI. Um, to do your initial wound assessment and patient assessment, really. Um, Heidi's been around for a long time. The H stands for history, which is medical, surgical, pharmacological, and social. You could even ask them, have you ever had a, a, a bad wound before? Or how have you ever coped with the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life? Uh, remembering some people actually use wounds as crutches uh, and and that keeps the family home or keeps the husband off the golf course or means the children will drop in more because mum's got a wound. So we have to check all of this out. 
E is examination, total body and the wound. So start big and then work in towards the wound. I is the investigations to be attended but also be re reviewed. Don't forget if the GP is ordering various tests, you want to make sure that, that you've seen the results of those tests also because when a GP is in a hurry, sometimes they'll just have a quick look and go, yes, that's fine, sign it and they're done. And then another set of eyes has a look and says, oh, but what about this? And you spot something on there. So two sets of eyes looking at investigations is a good idea. If you do all of that, then you should have enough information to actually make a diagnosis. And if you have a confirmed diagnosis, then you can go to those clinical pathways that were just shown on the screen. And because I've been involved in PHN pathways as well, I know that the answers are there for you. They are generic, yes, um, but they are going to help you a lot. If you have the name for your wound, you will have a pathway to follow. And then finally, of course, putting that whole thing into a care plan so that everybody can follow. So that's Heidi. In my opinion, the, uh, I've got there four factors, but there's actually five. Um, uh, so infection is number one for me. I work with elderly people. So infection usually is my major issue, followed then by nutritional status then edema. Edema is a curse and we must work harder to get rid of edema. A lack of diagnosis. Uh, the, the referrals I get, get, dear Jan, please see Mrs. Brown with a leg ulcer, does not help me at all. Um, it only tells me the ulcer's on her leg. And then, of course, in aged care settings and even some community settings, we may have pressure. Today I got referred um, a patient who is actually wearing a, a splint on their leg and that has actually rubbed and caused uh, the skin to come off the leg. So medical appliances can cause pressure as well. So the first thing, if you are in wound care uh, and you have not read this document, then I can't ask you enough. This is our Bible. This is something you must read and you must know. And the more you read it, the more you learn uh, and then it becomes second nature to you. So in the wound infection clinical practice, principles of best practice, which came out March last year, we have the wound infection continuum. And if you have a look at, we've got contaminated, colonized, locally infected, spreading infection, systemic infection. Look under contamination and colonization and you'll see that it says we need best practice, assess and monitor, but we do not need antimicrobials. When you hit local infection, you can see we need topical antimicrobials. And we only need systemic and topical antimicrobials when we hit the spreading and the systemic infection. So this whole notion of antibiotic stewardship is really relative when we see that local infection there. We have many agents that we can use topically on a wound to help fight local infection and we shouldn't be relying on antibiotics. So here are the um, the characteristics of the various infections uh, and you will see in the middle there we talk about uh, subtle signs of infection which is covert signs or overt signs which are the classic signs. So that's where most wounds that nurses are involved in and having trouble with that's where we work of course when you hit the spreading infection you've got a doctor you might have a surgeon involved and of course when you hit the systemic well they're in acute care and they may have multiple um, professionals helping them because they're septic from uh, the new document, uh, this is what it looks like. The previous slide was the old document, which is easier to read, but I have put this here just so that you can see the signs and symptoms or the characteristics are still there. And then down the bottom, they've got a little more information on watching for a potential biofilm. The next slide then goes on to say, uh, how to manage that. So you'll initiate biofilm-based wound care and you'll use a step-down, a step-up approach and perform therapeutic cleansing. Um, debridement's not always necessary when you're down in the contaminated colonised area, but when you're working in the locally infected area, we need debridement and post-debridement care, which generally uses topical antiseptics and then other 
uh, antimicrobial dressings. So a massive document for you to read, um, but really, really easy to read. And of course, if you're working in wound care, then it's absolutely relevant. And if you do download a copy, uh, it would be nice to leave it around for the doctors to have a look at so that they have a little bit of a role also in making sure that we don't overuse antibiotics. Um, it goes on then to explain the step down, step up biofilm based wound care. Also talking about the aggressive debridement in the first one to four days um, and then uh, treating it as, as it appears to be healing, uh, then de-escalate, um, evaluate, and if necessary, go up or go back down. So what are the antimicrobial cleansers that you have? There are many available, but of course we have Prontosan, which has been in Australia for a long, long time now, Microdacin, SOS, and Granudacin, uh, very similar now, uh, Octenolin, and then the MicroShield PV, RP, iodine surgical hand wash, and then the surgical uh, uh, scrub, the chlorhexidines. So whether you're a chlorhexidine or an iodine user for those things. So these are some of the most common things that we would use to clean wounds that we are worried about topically. With regard to dressings, then you might have iodosol powder and paste or ointment, uh, inodine, which is also a 1% iodine-based product. You've got flaminal, which is an enzyme algino gel, and there's flaminal fort uh, and flaminal, uh, uh, just flaminal, flaminal and flaminal fort. You've got um, silver products, and there's multiples of those on the market. A brand new one was given to me last week. So we have plenty of silver. Sorbact is the antimicrobial binding green dressing. Various honeys, hypertonic salt. Uh, there's another honey there. That's the meloxy. Why isn't it up above with the other honey? Um, because it's actually honey and olive oil. And then hydrofera blue. And um, there are more new products coming, I can assure you. Other agents or devices that may help get rid of the slough and the necrotic tissue, depending on your skill level and whether you're a registered nurse or an enrolled nurse. Enrolled nurses are not supposed to be using sharp instruments, but registered nurses in theory, provided that you've got the belief that you've got the training and you certainly have good anatomy skills, uh, then you, there is nothing that says you can't. Uh, do some conservative sharp wound debridement. Of course, you do have to clear that with your administrators wherever you work, so who you work under. But we would use scalpels, stitch cutters, curettes, uh, obviously scissors, uh, small scissors and forceps, uh, Deborah soft pad, the UCS cloth pad, De the debridement pad by V. Braun and the all prep uh, pad by Coloplast, and again, there's more of these coming. So uh, I would prefer that they didn't call them debridement pads. I would prefer that they call them cleaning pads um, because there is so much controversy around that word debridement. Next document that you would really need to have uh, in your toolbox would be this one available from woundhygiene.com. This came out uh, towards the end of COVID. We were delighted that it did come out um, because it gives you an early antibiofilm intervention strategy which says cleanse the wound, debride the wound, refashion the wound edge. In other words, we do not want callus, crusts, scabs, in wounds. You must clean all those away. And our problem right now um, is that most nurses coming out of training actually don't know how to clean wounds at all. Um, and they're frightened. Uh, so the wounds are being anointed rather than be cleaned. Um, and then, of course, once you've done all of that work, uh, you need to put a dressing on it. So this is another very good document that you should read. Here's some examples of things that I would get called to go and see and um, it's sort of frustrating because really all of these just need cleaning. All of these are actually doing quite well uh, and once you clean all those crusts and scabs off, you would find that the tissue underneath is quite good uh, and there's epithelium in the areas. So uh, this is what I mean by nurses not cleaning wounds and thinking that, oh, we need the wound consultant. No, you don't. you just got to get in there and clean it yourselves. 
One of the other things that influences uh, our wound healing, I said, was exudate or edema. Um, and so having an understanding of wound exudate is important. So this document, Wound Exudate Effective Assessment and Management, is downloadable from Wounds International. It's an excellent document. It's a few years old now, um, but it is really, really good. It has tables in there that will explain the colour of the exudate and therefore maybe what you should be looking for, as well as if you've got a lot of exudate, uh, what you would be looking for. So very good document. And all these are easy to read. Um, I've just uh, put this together myself, uh, was talking about the difference between transudate and exudate uh, and uh, I've got the characteristics and um, uh, the protein content, the specific gravity, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see uh, that there is some differences in some of the fluid that comes out of the body and some is much more toxic uh, to tissue than others. After considering infection in all its forms, then I think about nutrition. Uh, without nutrition, the body will not heal. Um, we need to feed it. Um, those cells have a lot of work to do, and so we've got to give them the energy to be able to do that work. So this is taken from an old textbook, just trying to put it into uh, concept for you. You can see in the inflammatory phase, uh, well, you definitely need energy and iron. In the proliferative phase, when it, you know you're trying to build all that tissue, you need energy, protein, zinc, vitamin A, and vitamin C, and you need the same again uh, in the maturation phase. The most important thing in the maturation phase is to keep going with that uh, vitamin C and the zinc, um, and that is all to help produce that collagen, and the collagen will give the tissue strength. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't uploaded the new uh, picture uh, books. Uh, I actually got them in the car because I'm lecturing tomorrow. Um, but if you go to this 1-800 number, uh, there's a little booklet that you can get called Nutrition and Wound Healing. Uh, and then there's another one called Support Wound Healing from the Inside Out. That's for the patient to read. And this explains the role of all those nutrients, etc. It is published by Nestle, but it is generic and does not push any Nestle product. Also, you can do a mini nutritional assessment uh, on your elderly patients. So that's downloadable from the website mentioned in the bottom of the slide. If you do no note that the resident or the patient is not eating well, and remember patients will tell you fibs, so, you know, you have to have a high level of suspicion. If you're um, visiting home nurses, you can always offer to make a cup of tea and check out the fridge when you get the milk out and see what kind of food is in there. Um, I actually did that recently with a friend of mine that was not well and I took him to his doctor's and brought him home and then went to put the kettle on and make some tea and there was nothing in the fridge. He said, oh, he'd meant to buy it uh, shopping on Sunday. Well, that was three days ago. Um, so no wonder he wasn't well. <laughs> well. Um, so if you're suspicious about the nutritional intake, you should get bloods done. And, of course, what we're really interested in is the serum albumin level and the iron level. And if we're going to supplement them, then Enprocal Repair, um, Resource, or the Arginade, or the Ensure. Edema, well, you have to understand what may have caused the edema. So here definitely you are working with the doctor as well. Um, but, of course, we've got the common um, causes. So we've got cardiac failure, venous disease, renal disease, pulmonary disease, liver disease, some medications, remember calcium channel blockers uh, or hormonal medications or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and Mayo inhibitors all have a side effect of peripheral edema. And then there are some others such as uh, lymphedema, pregnancy, premenstrual symptoms, uh, malnutrition uh, and uh, inflammation or sepsis. So there are many reasons why someone will have edema and we have to work out what it is and then we have to see if we can control that and what can we do to help eliminate the edema. So um, pressure injuries are not commonly seen in primary care, but the ones that you may see in primary care are these people who are wearing footwear and they have edema and they're squeezing their foot into their footwear 
or they're not adjusting their footwear according to the level of edema they have. And then the next minute they've got wounds between their toes because their toes have been squashed together or a blister on the heel or the bunion, which is very common. Um, so, you know, we do have to look at the big picture of what edema is doing to them sometimes. Um, this is a wound on a foot. Uh, and this type of wound, uh, this is the plantar surface, sorry, I should tell you, the plantar surface of the wound of the foot, and um, it's a disgusting wound. So if you look at the tissue in there, it's not very pretty at all. And if you go down at 6 o'clock, you'll see that there's another wound there, and when you put a probe in the top, you come out that wound. This is really, really serious. Uh, the infection is spreading along the fascial planes as the person plantar flexes their foot and walks uh, and we would not be wanting to treat this in a general practice setting this person needs to go to hospital and get off this foot uh, and obviously be seen by infectious diseases physicians and have all kinds of tests done so with regard to the foot wounds uh, these documents came out so there's the international working group for diabetic foot uh, that's on the right hand side um, that's a group that we've been liaising with for many, many years now. Um, but in Australia, when a group looked at that document, they said it doesn't suit our Australian profile. And so we have uh, the Australian and International Guideline on Diabetic Foot Disease uh, that came out in COVID as well, um, late COVID um, from uh, diabetes, Diabetic Foot Australia. Um, so you can see the site there. And there are six modules or six guidelines within the larger guidelines broken down into smaller guidelines. Uh, each one of them is accompanied by a webinar. Uh, these are excellent. Um, we are challenging some of the wound healing interventions that are mentioned in there. Um, we have a big meeting coming up in February and we will challenge some of the statements that are in that document. Um, but still, the the overall essence is uh, if you've got a, a wound in a person with diabetes, then you must get them off that wound. So offloading is vital. So foot ulcer prevention, you can identify the, uh, the foot at risk. You need to regularly inspect and examine the foot at risk, educate the patient, the family and the healthcare professionals, ensure routine wearing of appropriate footwear and treat risk factors for foot ulceration. Don't think that your colleague has checked their feet last time they were in. You check their feet. Uh, every time they come to a general practice clinic, uh, you should be, they come for a cold, you say, oh, while you're here, I'll just have a look at your feet. If they're a diabetic, constant checking is vital. And of course, they'll tell you fibs. So you need to be doing the checking. You can palpate the pulses, which is what we want you to do. You can also use a uh, Semmers Weinstein 10 gram monofilament. Uh, as demonstrated here on the right-hand side of the screen. And you can also use 128 hertz tuning fork to see if they can sense vibration. These are all to test their neuropathy, presence of neuropathy or not. Of course, what does the correct footwear for an elderly person or anyone who has high-risk feet look like? Well, it's not, you know, the, the, the Manola Blantz uh, shoes or, you know, some of those fancy, fancy shoes. They don't like wearing this sort of footwear because it's boring, they think, but it is practical. And down the bottom you can see uh, the what that we're really needing in a good foot or shoe for an elderly person is a supporting heel or collar, a beveled heel, a uh, low heel height, um, a rocker angle, um, mid sole and medium hardness, um, enough space to wriggle their toes and also a high toe box and the fasting mechanisms, whether they be Velcro or multiple laces. Laces are preferred. Um, but some of them can't do those up, so Velcro would be acceptable. Um, but there are plenty of quite nice shoes, and we need to get them into their appropriate footwear to prevent any of these injuries. Without a doubt, all the texts that you read uh, talk about a multidisciplinary team approach to diabetic foot wounds. So you don't work in isolation in general practice. You shouldn't be working 
on a person who has uh, diabetes and has a foot wound in the community without consulting some of the other people that you would expect to have in a multidisciplinary team. Of course, where possible, you'll have skilled podiatrists involved, um, but if they're not available, then it would be a really good idea if you attended one of their clinics and you were trained. And most podiatrists who work in high-risk foot clinics are very keen to teach others how to offload. So this is just an example of how to offload that particular ulcer so you can see how much podiatry felt we're using. Of course, you can use the Darko-type shoes, um, but they may create balance problems in some of our elderly, uh, and that is an issue. So the overarching principles in wound management are to understand how the wound commenced and what type of wound it may be and give it a name. Then look at the whole patient and decide what factors may be influencing healing and address those. Then you will select the appropriate dressing or device according to the tissue type in the wound, the volume and type of exudate the depth and the aim, and there may be other things to consider as well. And then once healed, you'll revisit the etiology to ensure that all prevention strategies have been addressed. So if you allow me, we diagnosed it as a venous leg ulcer. We looked at the person and encouraged them to eat more protein because all the fluid that's coming out is proteinaceous. Um, we chose the right dressing by using an addressing that absorbed the exudate and we put them into compression therapy and we got them healed and now we have to keep them in compression therapy. Otherwise, it will recur again. So that's just an example of how to put those overarching principles into practice. With regard to products that you have, many people don't really know enough about their products. So if a representative comes to the clinic um, and you have the opportunity to learn from them, please do learn. You don't have to take everything they say on board, but you will learn from them. They've trained in their products. We talk about products pharmacologically, which would be using headings like these. Um, once you learn about the product, you then start to think about the product by its aim. So in other words, what does this product do for me in wound care? So this is just a few more of the pharmacological names that are out there for the products. Whereas we might talk about <clears throat> like this, wound protection products, wound rehydration or donation products, moisture retention, exudate management, debridement, antimicrobial, skin care and cleansers and surfactants. So you would take the product brand name you know and shove it under the one of these headings. If you can do that, then we know you've got a better understanding of your product. Therefore, your product selection is probably going to be much more accurate than just knowing a brand name. So you blank matrix like this, where we put all the headings across the top and then down the left-hand side, we put the product group and then we go across and say, oh, well, an impregnated gauze uh, doesn't manage moisture, it doesn't donate moisture, and it doesn't hold the moisture in, but it does protect tissue. It's not good for wound debridement, doesn't manage infection, for example. So you could do this type of thing. You need to have structure in, in your workplace to help everyone decide what products go on what wounds. Of course, you could just do it on tissue types. So down the left-hand side, we put all the tissue. And then across the top, we put generically or brand name of the products that we have available in the facility and, and whether it's suitable or not suitable, what I need to watch for. And the last one is a much more comprehensive one where you've put the product type down on the left hand side and underneath that you could actually put the product brand name and then you've come across and described what its function is and therefore what type of wound it would go on and give an example and how frequently it would need changing whatever you do put structure in your workplace and you'll get greater results because there's consistency of care 
part of the problem that we always have is nurse A does something and then she goes on days off and nurse B comes in and, oh, no, she wants to do something different. Um, so you can certainly change it if you can justify why the product before was not suitable. So now moving into the various things that we were going to talk about, um, skin tears, um, so we all use the STAR tool. Um, so this one for the S says stop and control the bleeding. T is to realign the tissue. A is to do a holistic assessment. And then R is to re review again, um, particularly if the flap had an unusual colour, et cetera. And we used to think that skin tears were just simple little wounds, but we realised the complexity of them um, when we started to deal with more elderly people. Um, there are two tools out there. There is the STAR tool itself, which was brought into Australia in 2017, and the ICETAP, which is the International Skin Tear Advisory Panel Skin Tear Classification Tool. They are different, uh, and we would prefer that in Australia we will stay with our STAR tool, which has a category 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, and 3, and the descriptors are underneath those. So the 1A, should we be using Steri-Strips? The reality is that in aged care we're not allowed to use them, and there are many reasons why. But I know because I ran a clinic for 16 years in general practice, we use them in our general practice, particularly on a Category 1A. All right, but why did it work in general practice and not in aged care? It's because there are too many um, variables in aged care. In general practice, there's generally only one or two practice nurses and you're working as a team together. So what she does, I do, et cetera, et cetera. So we know how to manage these. But um, in aged care, somebody comes along and says, oh, no, we need to take them off and clean it and, and then we have trouble. So there's your 1B, which is really the flap edges have just about reapproximated, um, but the flap doesn't look well. So you probably wouldn't put steri strips on that sick flap, but you know, you really want to keep an eye on it. Um, but you probably use an impregnated mesh just to protect it, hold it in place and protect it. Now you could use a plain impregnated mesh, or you could use an antimicrobial impregnated mesh. There's your 2A, which is a healthy piece of skin, but it doesn't come together, um, but it doesn't look too bad. And there's your 2B where, oh, dear, it hasn't come together and those skin flaps don't look very good at all. And then lastly, of course, you've got no skin flap, so that's the Category 3. So ideally in a general practice setting, you will have a regime written down so that everyone can follow what to do with Category 1s, Category 2s and Category 3s, and everybody does the same. You then get much, much better consistency of care and therefore you do get better healing rates. What's more, it's also very reassuring for the patient to know that everybody's doing the same thing. So the principles of care for skin tears are to stop the bleeding, cleanse the area, attempt to reapproximate the skin edges, pat, dry, classify, and follow a protocol of management, set timelines, and regularly check against these. So in my experience, steri strips are okay for category one if everyone follows the plan of not removing unnecessarily. Otherwise, any concerns, you're probably going to use a mesh. Category two and three definitely probably need a mesh. And some of the meshes that are on the market are Ergo Tool, Silnet, Adaptic Touch, Hydra Tool. And then you'd cover it with a foam, whether it be an Aquacel foam or a Biotane Silicon or an Aleven or a Proximal or any other brand name foam. However, if you're worried about infection, you probably won't use a foam uh, and you may not use a mesh. You may use iodosol powder or flaminol fort. And lastly, don't forget that on the outside, you need to put a directional arrow so everyone knows which way to remove that dressing and not undo the flap. The timelines for healing are Category 1 should be healed within one to two weeks, Category 2 within two to three weeks, and we give you about a month to make sure that Category 3 is well on its way. Of course, they may not be fully healed in these timeframes, but you are confident you are very close to the end. If, however, your skin tear is not 
doing what it's supposed to do. This is some of the things that can go wrong. You can have further bleeding um, because they are on anticoagulants and those skin flaps just can't stick because it's bleeding all the time. You can have too much exudate and hence the area is too moist and that makes the flaps soggy and macerated, which then leads to infection. Or it could be slow to heal because it's changing morphologically into a skin cancer or depending on where it happened, it may actually be a venous ulcer or an arterial ulcer or even a vasculitic ulcer, particularly if the skin tear was on the lower leg. I would strongly suggest that you need to think about the fragility of some of these elderly people's skin. I'm not big on putting adhesives on their skin. I prefer to use the tube uh, thing at the bottom there and the right hand side that has a blue line on it or a green line or a yellow line and then of course once you get them healed if they're frequent flyers coming in with skin tears you might want to recommend that they wear these padded sleeves uh, when they're out and about so that they're protecting their limbs. So then in some of the places that I work we take photographs of all the things that should be on our trolley or within reach uh, that we may use on managing a skin tear. So you can see here, we've got the Caltostat for bleeding. We've got a Mepitel mesh. We have got some Steri strips if we were so inclined. We've got some Iodosorb powder if we were worried about infection. We've got an Aquacel foam adhesive if we wanted to seal it off. However, most times we would use an absorbent pad such as Zechevit and the Tubifast and then the crepe bandage and inspect it in a few days time. If we're happy with how it looks, we may then wrap it up and put a waterproof dressing on it. But of course, we'd still put the tubi fast and the bandage just to give added protection and support. So despite common perceptions, the principal driver of wound care costs uh, is really the cost of providing the care and not the cost of the dressings or devices used. And there was an analysis of two large general practice databases in the United Kingdom that found that wound dressings accounted for only 2.9% of the total wound care costs. And in another one, the database of wound care products accounted for 13.9%, um, uh, so still very low. Without a doubt, to prevent skin tears in the elderly, you should be educating them about hydrating their skin, keeping their skin soft, supple and hydrated. They will all go to the $2 shop and they'll buy the cheapest moisturiser they can. And sadly, cheap moisturisers tend to be just water and that will evaporate. So these are some of the good brand names uh, that we would recommend. Dermese, the QV Derm Care, which has got the ceramides in it, which is having really, well, it's now a medical device, although the product price hasn't gone up, um, or the Dermal Company with their sensitive skin lotions and, and a whole range of skin lotions, uh, or the CeraVe you've seen on TV. Good brand names is what you need to go for. Next is the ulceration of the lower legs. And if you've done your homework uh, and you're really up there, you would be able to say, gee, that looks like a venous leg ulcer. Of course, you want to know a lot more about the ulcer and about me uh, before you make that diagnosis. But clearly, we do have visible varicose veins. We have the pigmentation. The wound is located in the right area. It's relatively clean and it has no irregular shape. And we can see they also have some edema in their leg by the ridging of the product that was on top. So we're pretty sure this is a venous leg ulcer. But to help you, uh, you could go to the Wounds Australia website and download the Australian New Zealand Clinical Practice Guideline for the prevention and management of venous leg ulcers. There's also an excellent flow chart, but I would suspect that the flow chart is also in your pathways that are available for you from the PHN because they're in our, our uh, PHN pathway. So getting the etiology right is not really the nurse's job. It is the role of the doctor. Um, but we can often ask questions to help and give that information to the doctor. So you want to inquire about the initiating factors. You need to determine if there is any family history of leg ulceration, venous leg ulcers running families, you want to ask the pharmacist or the doctor to review medications, particularly any that may precipitate lower leg edema. 
You want to palpate the leg and foot pulses, note the size, site and characteristics of the alteration, ulceration and inquire about any previous treatments they may have had. You may do some laboratory tests such as base blood lines uh, levels, serum albumin, serum glucose, ESR and CRPs if you think about um, inflammation, ABPI uh, duplex scan, or if you've done all of that and you still don't know what the cause of this wound is, then you may have to do a biopsy and take one for histopathology and one for micropathology. But the statistics are 70% of ulceration on lower legs are caused by problems with veins, 10% are arteries, 10% are mixed venous arterial, 2% are skin cancers, and 8% are quite unusual, generally under the control of a good dermatologist or a rheumatologist or a hematologist. So these are the characteristics of venous ulcers. And if you're working in a general practice clinic and seeing people with wounds on their lower legs, you should know this slide off by heart, okay? So there's your visible varicose veins. There's the pigmentation in the lower third of the lower leg. There's the clean ulcer, uh, not too sloughy, uh, generally with an irregular edge versus the arterial, which are totally different. If there's straight venous, straight arterial, they are very different in characteristics. So you have to know these as well. And of course, the arterial are usually deep. They can be over a site of trauma. They have well-defined edges uh, and they're either on the foot or higher up on the leg or on the back of the leg. And you can see them on the toes here. You can also see in the upper left picture um, with those toes that have gone a purpley blue color and a demarcation line across midfoot. And this is a dependent rubor and elevation pallor. When you pick it up, those toes go white. That's a positive Burgers test. And you will see that that's indicated on the third dot point up from the bottom, elevation pallor dependent rubor. So that's another test that you can do in, in your clinic. So the treatment of arterial ulcers requires antimicrobial coverage while waiting for the vascular surgeon to work out what they can do. Uh, if it's necrotic we, and we're aiming to heal, we may debride, but, but if we know the vascular surgeon can't do anything, uh, and the tissue is dry, we will hold on to that tissue uh, using betadine every day to keep it hard and dry to keep the bugs away. Of course, if it's straight venous, we use a lot of zinc and then padding and then bandages and then compression therapy uh, and um, hopefully that will all stay in place for a week, um, encouraging to walk and elevate and over time, we would get it healed. Venous ulcers are traditionally slow to heal using even best practice. The general advice for venous is to walk, do calf and foot muscle exercises and elevate the foot of the bed and elevate the feet when sitting above the level of the hip and then keep those compression bandages going. And with arterial, obviously, don't sit near heaters, don't use restrictive garments, uh, make sure that the, you have regular podiatry, sit with the legs in the neutral position and wear natural fibre clothing. Your job is to feel the foot pulses, so the dorsalis pedis is on the top of the foot and the posterior tibialis is up behind the medial malleolus. We use a lot of straight elasticated tubular bandages, brand name Tubi Grip is one company, one layer on the appropriate size limb will give six millimetres of mercury uh, pressure at the ankle. And so this practice of doing three layers is very common. It has been published uh, and it, it, is, it allows the patient, if they need at night, to take layer three and layer two off. And next morning before they get up, they put layer two and layer three back on. This is graduated compression. So there's more pressure at the ankle, less at the calf, and then minimal at the knee, pushing the fluid from the bottom up. 
Of course, there are many multi-layered compression bandage systems out there. Um, and we tend to go for these two layer types now if we're going to use them. They are considered gold standard. You need to be trained how to apply these and obviously educate your patient to report any discomfort immediately. Um, but overall, most of these two layer bandage systems applied correctly are very well tolerated by the patient. Should we use bandages uh, or hosiery to help heal? We'll always use bandages first because of the bulkiness of the dressings underneath. And if you go into hosiery too quickly because they are elastic, it allows some edema and so the young skin can break down again. So if we heal a venous leg ulcer using bandages, we'll keep them in the bandage for another month after healing so that that um, epithelium can mature. Once you've got them healed, you need to consider would you put them into other forms of compression? Um, the evidence is you only have to have knee high. I prefer closed toes versus open toes, uh, and there are plenty of appliances to help get them on. Um, you, they need to be measured for them, though. And if they're not measured correctly, then you may end up with damage like this. To help elderly now, there are Velcro uh, wraps available. These are becoming extremely popular in aged care um, and they really do help when you have an elderly couple and one's got to help the other. Uh, you just put the leg on and just pull these Velcro over the top. Um, they are very, very, very good and becoming, a, you know, really a common practice. Of course, if they can't tolerate any of that, we would put them into a pump. So I've put a patient in a pump today um, be interesting to see how he goes in two weeks' time. These are rentable, uh, very, very economically rentable, and um, I have great success with these, both in aged care and in general practice settings. Other documents I'd suggest you look at at the Wounds International are the optimising of patient wound care through engagement, the triangle of wound assessment, and the strategies to reduce practice variation. Of course, there's a brilliant one at the European Wound Management site called Other Types of Atypical Wounds, and then use of oxygen therapies, of which we've got more coming to Australia, and use of advanced therapies in wound management. Then you've got one on skin graft, one on, on uh, patient involvement, and one on skin tears. So I can't encourage you enough to visit these websites where there's plenty of free information. It is not hard to read, um, quite easy uh, to read these documents and learn from them. So now over to any questions. Thanks, Helene. Is Helene there? Yeah, I'm here. Ah, there you go. Good. I don't, I don't think I have actually have any questions yet. So um, we do have a little bit of time. If anybody's got a question, type them in that question and answer box down the bottom of your screen there. Um, Jan will only be too happy to answer yeah. those for you. Because I did go at the rate of knots because I wanted to get through all of that. There's lots and lots of information in there. Um, and so I, I am used to not getting questions because there is so much in there. Um, but you can ask a question not related to what's been talked about tonight. If you had a problematic wound uh, right now, um, I'm more than happy to take any of your questions. So. What are my thoughts on doctors suturing skin tears? Well, generally not good, all right? Um, I know even here in Melbourne we can send patients to with a nasty skin tear, and, of course, that's one of the protocols. If you can't stop the bleeding, you've got to send them to acute care. So you send them acute care, a registrar comes in and tries to sew it and tears that skin flap. Uh, most of these people actually have very thin skin that's why they got a skin tear and putting a suture in is not generally a good idea um question on burns there i saw what exactly was the question while you're getting that through i do have a couple of questions come through hi jan great okay. presentation do you have any experience with blast x product yes yes um, yes, so Blastex has been around now for maybe a year, maybe. Um, yes, it's a very interesting product. Um, 
and so yes, I've tried it. I've had ex I've had success with it. Um, my colleagues have also tried it because we're really lucky. We do get to try these products fairly soon after they come into the country um, just so we can speak about them. So I would say, yes, it's readily available at pharmacy. So that's number one. That's a good um um, what's a good option you know you're not they're not patients in community settings are able to go to their pharmacy and get it um, it's simple to use um, it's natural products so it's not biological products if that's the right word to use um, and so yeah give it a go um, the teaching always is if you're going to try something you try it for two weeks and then you reevaluate after I mean unless you put it on and then next dressing uh, all hell is broken loose, then, of course, you wouldn't use it. Um, but if you go, oh, I'm not sure if it's made a difference, then use it again and use it again and evaluate in two weeks' time. Yep. Um, so the burns question, acute burns management, preferred product for acute burns, silver or flaminol. Okay, so in my general practice clinic, um, because I had healthy patients, young boys coming with burns from the Holmes Glen College, burning themselves with the oxyacetylene torches, um, they were healthy, we used flaminol. If I had an elderly patient, uh, which I've got one in a nursing home right now, um, we would use flaminol. Um, if they're large burns or they're dirty burns, you know, so they've been camping and fell into a bush fire, into a fire, open fire, then I call that a dirty burn. And then, yes, you probably want to use silver. Uh, all our burns unit, when they're large surface area burns, uh, would use silver. But if we're talking community general practice, you're not looking after anything in theory more than 5% total body surface area. And 5% is a pretty big burn. So some of you might even say, I'm not going to look after anything greater than 2% total body surface area because of the cost. So uh, Flaminel, I find, is very, very good. Be interested in your own experience, John. Um, I do have another question. Dressings for buruli ulcer. Ah, oh, buruli ulcer. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so buruli ulcer is very painful. Um, uh, they're on triple antibiotics, and so getting the right antibiotics is the key. Uh, once they start on the right antibiotics, um, they should start to respond. I've used silver. I've uh, particularly the ones like the gelling fibres that have silver in them um, so that it's not traumatic taking them out because, remember, the Beruli's got the undermined edge um, and so you're kind of packing in. Or I have used Flaminal on wrung out saline gauze um, and as those edges start to stick down, uh, then I've gone to the sorbact. Um, but I haven't used iodine. I wouldn't use iodine because iodine is a pro-inflammatory um, and we don't need more inflammation in the Beryllium. Uh Just uh, another question in the chats there about could you please clarify is if flamazine or SSD cream or flaminol as she was saying? Yeah, yeah. okay. So um, flamazine would be used in the burns units. Uh, the problem with flamazine is that it creates a pseudo eschar. So, you know, when you first get a burn, you've lost the skin and you've got this red area. If you put flamazine on, then next day or the day after when you're doing the dressings, you're already starting to see a yellow scum. And so then it's a controversy people go well it's infected but it's not infected it's the residue of what makes it a cream that won't come off whereas flaminol is water soluble so when you clean it you're cleaning it all completely away so just remember what i'm talking about though are small surface area superficial partial thickness burns we shouldn't, in general practice, be looking after full thickness burns. Um, however, if it's full thickness and it's only 10 centimetre size, 10, sorry, 10 cent piece size, the patient may not want to go to hospital and have a skin graft, clearly. Uh, so you just tell them we'll look after it. So we keep it hydrated, flaminol, 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 keep going. 
slower to heal uh, and they will heal with the scar. So we have to make sure that we're working within our boundaries. If you go to Vic Burns' website, it is excellent for uh, knowing what should be referred to the Victorian Trauma Unit and what you can look after in a general practice setting. It's an excellent website with lots of charts that you can download and put up on the wall, etc. Okay, I think that's the end of the questions, Jan. Could I take this opportunity wow. to thank you on behalf of our PHN? That was excellent, as, as you always are. Um, so thank you very much, Jan, and for taking the time. I know how busy you are and all the lectures you give at all times of night and day over the world. So thank you very much, um, and I'm sure we will see you again. And thank you, for everyone, for attending. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night.